He's asking the question of how do you figure out how to get tight? And holy crap, that's a great question because it's, it's easy to understand. Um, it's not even easy to understand after you've been lifting for a long time, uh, much less being a newbie. Uh, number one thing to be able to create tightness, in my opinion, is to have some formidable amount of muscle mass on your body. If you don't have any muscle mass on your body, if you don't, really look like you lift or you haven't made significant changes to your body yet, it's going to be hard to really understand what anybody's talking about when they're talking about getting tight. It's an unfortunate thing, but it's the truth. Uh, sometimes like if somebody's setting up for a squat, someone like Silent Mike who's been lifting for years, he sets up for a squat and he has his arms back behind his body and I feel his upper body. I know. I'm going to feel this most wonderful traps <laughs> and rear delts. I'm going to start to massage and rub his back, and I'm going to get some oil. Oh, sorry. I thought, sorry. We, were, I thought we were alone. Woo. Sorry about that. <clears throat> no, I'm going to see that there's a lot of muscle mass back there. I'm going to see that there's a shelf for the bar to rest on. And so without, without that muscle mass, it's going to be hard to even feel any sort of tightness. You don't have to be big and jacked for that to happen, but you have to have, ha you have, to, uh, have made some changes in your body. You have to have more muscle than you did maybe a year ago or something like that. So that's number one. Number two is in order to, in order to feel the, the tightness that they're talking about in a bench squat and deadlift is you need to probably understand that when we're talking about uh, benching, squatting, and deadlifting, that they're really all sort of the same movement in a lot of ways. They can be boiled down and broken down uh, in very similar ways. So whenever you do a bench, squat, or deadlift, there's going to be a couple things that remain the same. Number one is that you have a neutral spine. Your spine starts from the top of your head to the bottom of your butt crack. You have to have a neutral spine, so your neck's not going to be, you're not going to be like this. You're not going to be like this. You're not going to be like this. You're not going to be overarched. You're not going to be in flexion. You're not going to be rounded, right? So all those things are, def are things to keep in mind. Another thing you're going to be, another thing you're going to have to do in order to get tight and to get everything locked in and get everything right is you're going to have to keep your stomach tight. Now, what do we mean about keeping the stomach tight? Pretty simple. All we're trying to do. We're just trying to take some air into our stomach. If you're somebody that uses a lifting belt, you want to actually push your stomach into the belt. If you don't use a belt, then you're going to want to take a nice deep breath into your stomach and tighten up your stomach and try to brace it for a very, very hard punch to the stomach that a brother or a sister might do to you when you're not paying attention, that type of thing. Basically on the squat, you want your elbow down and in. On the bench, you want your elbow down and in. And on the deadlift, you want your elbow down and in. Because you want to be able to have your lats flexed. When you flex your lats, it's going to kind of elongate your arm. It's going to keep your body tucked into itself. You'll be in a much more powerful, more bound up, wound up position to be able to execute the lift properly. And so those, those three things are all common things amongst all three of the lifts. And those are things that you can carry into trying to figure out how to get yourself tight. Uh, greatest obstacle I ever faced in lifting uh, would have to be falling with 1,085. Um, I fell, and for those of you who haven't seen the video, I wiped out pretty good with 1,085, and that fucked me up pretty bad for a pretty long time. Uh, I was hurt for a good three months. I couldn't get uh, from my, I couldn't get uh, from my downstairs couch to my bedroom upstairs for about two months. Um, I couldn't, the first night that it happened, I couldn't go from my, my couch to my layout bed that's downstairs. The first night I was able to shimmy my way from my couch, or from, from my couch to my like rollout couch. 
Uh, the first night I was able to do that, it took me about an hour to move uh, probably 20 feet. So that whole, uh, that whole process took a very long time. And uh, it's the mental side of things that makes it hard. Uh, but for every failure that I've ever had, there's always been good shit that's come of it. I don't know what the fuck will come of that, but <laughs> hopefully something cool will happen. Uh, I tore my pec many times, uh, probably about four different times, tweaked it, torn it, whatever you want to call it. And luckily, I've never had a major, I've never had any, any major injury. I mean, the fall wiped me the fuck out, but I've never had any surgeries or anything like that. Uh, through five years of pro wrestling, a lot of, uh, a lot of football and shit loads of power the thing luckily i've never had that happen but um <clears throat> it took a long time to recover from the mental side of things just getting underneath the squat rack again was really hard um, trying to even just to figure out how to squat was hard and my knees and my hips uh will most likely never be the same they don't still move the same way uh but a couple days ago i hit a uh, 605 squat for a double, which is, again is a PR for me. So the lesson there is just never give up. Don't ever stop. Um, I, I can be scared and I can just be on my couch and I can be in pain like every other person that's getting older. And I can just sit there and get fatter and watch my dick get smaller. <laughs> or I can still enjoy myself and still have fun doing the fucking things that I love to do. Um, one of the times I tore my pec, I was able to invent the slingshot. So a lot of times the things that happen to you might get in sidelines from this contest. You don't really know what it will turn into. We don't know yet what it will turn into. But maybe it's making him, maybe it's just making him rethink the way he trains and he's going to become stronger for it. That's not such a bad thing either, right? Maybe it's going to make him rethink the way he trains a little bit and never get hurt again or have the ability to make sure no one that he ever works with ever gets hurt. Or maybe it'll, it'll uh, help him in some other business uh, endeavor or something like that. We don't really know. As he was mentioning earlier, he sacrificed for the unknown. The time and effort and the things that you, the time you put in now, you don't know exactly what it's for, but you know it's important. It's called accommodating resistance. The weights are lighter at the bottom, weights are lighter at the bottom and they are heavier at the top in all, in all the cases, whether you're doing reverse band or whether you're lifting with bands against you. It's a similar thing. I know it blows your mind, but the weights are still lighter at the bottom and they're still heavier at the top. Everybody follow that? We're on page 43. <clears throat> um, so the reason why people utilize those techniques are for many reasons. Reason number one, why I like the usage of bands and chains is because it, it allows you to, to try something different. It gives you, it gives you, a, uh, it gives you, it's more fun to try something different, try something new. It allows for a whole new thing of PRs to open up for you. If you've never done a set of five with chains on the bar before, well, guess what? You win the invisible balloon for the day and you can be excited because you got a PR. You, you did something you never tried before and yay, you got a PR, right? So there's that side of things. It can be fun. The other thing that bands and chains can do is, let's say that you tweaked your shoulder, your shoulder hurts, you've been training uh, overhead presses a lot and something's bothering your shoulder. If you utilize chains, the chains are deloaded 100% at the bottom of the lift. So if you have like 200 pounds on the bar and you had 100 pounds of chains on the bar, when you get to the top of the lift, you'll have 300 total pounds. At the bottom of the lift, you'll have 200 total pounds. What feels better on your shoulder to have it be 200 pounds at the bottom, like in the case of a slingshot or in the case of utilizing chains? Or would it feel better for it to be 300 pounds at the bottom of the lift where your shoulder is in the most compromised position? So it allows you to lift, it allows you to kind of get away with some different things. Same thing with knee pain in the squat. You can try bands or chains. Chains are a little bit better because you can set them up in such a way that they're completely off the bar in the bottom of the lift. Bands can't really be set up that way, so um, they're a little different, but the bands and chains help you to accelerate, they help you become faster. Where you utilize them in your training, if you're somebody that's uh, real meticulous 
and follows a plan and gets a plan from a coach, you might want to only use it in your assistance work. If you want to still venture out and utilize those, those tools, uh, utilize them when your contest is further away than uh, 12 weeks or so. As, as any competition gets closer, whether you uh, do CrossFit or whether you do Olympic lifting, powerlifting, football, no matter what it is that you do, you want to get more closely related to the sport itself as you get closer to the contest. So things like bands and things like chains, not like you can't use them. A lot of people have successfully used them, uh, but it's a little bit of a guessing game. And so to get away from the guessing game, you just use regular barbell weight, keep things simplified, because you can still make a lot of great progress that way as the contest gets closer. So I would say uh, any time before the last, maybe about eight weeks before a contest, is a great time to utilize bands or chains. Uh, recently, I made a few videos about warming up on my YouTube, youtube.com slash supertraining06. You can check out some of that stuff. Uh, but to simplify things, uh, you only need to be prepared for the movement itself. Uh, and your body does actually physically need to be warm. So it's 9 million degrees in here. So how much warming up do we need? Probably not a ton. But uh, in general, your body needs to be warm for the movement that you're about to do. So at super training, a lot of times we will utilize some different movements to just get some blood in the area. So for me, say like on a squat, I might uh, work on my upper body since my upper body mobility is the worst piece of the puzzle in trying to figure out how to get my arms back for the squat. So I'll do things like face pulls with bands. <clears throat> I'll do like some bench pressing motions with bands, get a lot of blood into my elbows and my shoulders and get everything warm. If I go in cold and try to get underneath the bar, it's that much harder for me to get underneath the bar. So your warm up is gonna have two different components to it. Actually just physically getting your body warm through some movements. And then secondly, actually doing the movement itself as you see everyone do it progressively adding more weight. Uh, the first thing could be, there's just so many options when it comes to warming up. What you're looking for are things that are easy and reasonable for you to do uh, when you get out of your car. Maybe you have a long drive to the gym. Maybe you have a, a manual labor job and you're, you're shot for the day. Or maybe you have a desk job and you're just rounded over all day. Whatever the case is, it's kind of unreasonable for you to go from that job or whatever it is you were doing to walking in the gym and lifting like a savage. So you need to figure out how the fuck do I get myself warmed up and ready for this workout. There's uh, some things you can do for mobility and stuff like that. I'm gonna leave some of that aside for now. Um, but something like the hip circle is really easy. You guys have seen that from me, how much you bench.net. So there's a lot of things. You can hop on a stationary bike, move around for three to five minutes, do a couple of sprints, get your body ready to go. Some people even like to do, uh, once, they, once, they, once they get to the gym and they start to move around a little bit, like to do a little bit of light plyo work because it will heighten your central nervous system a little bit. So there's a lot of options in terms of the different things that you can do uh, before you move into the actual barbell stuff. Now for the barbell stuff itself, uh, in my opinion, you want to do as little work as possible to get you set up for the workout for the day. Even if you're going to do five sets of five or three sets of 10 or 10 sets, it doesn't matter what you're going to do for the day. Uh, what matters is that you are ready to go through those movements as strongly and as explosively as you can. Uh, so a lot of times in our gym, we'll, we do what I, what I refer to as cheating the system, which is doing less reps in your warm-up than you actually do for your main sets. Uh, a, a good way to kind of fatigue yourself and to um, take away from your main sets is to do too many reps in your warm-up. You can't do too many sets, in my opinion, but you can do too many reps. So if you do 15 continuous reps with 225, and your goal for the day was to do 275 for three sets of three, you have probably pre-fatigued yourself pretty good with 275 for 15 reps to the point where three sets of three is now gonna be pretty hard because you got some lactic acid in your chest. You got a pump going in your chest and it's gonna be that much harder for you to get through the workout. So utilize low reps, but maybe more sets. We always uh, use the bar in our gym. We might do the bar for a bunch of reps because it's so light, it doesn't matter. 
95 pounds, 135, 185, 225, and so on. We'll take quarter jumps all the way up usually. For me, I'm more experienced so I can make bigger jumps sometimes and I feel comfortable doing that. And for me, that's an ad adrenaline dump, adrenaline kick. That'll kick in just from me even seeing that it went from four plates to five plates. It automatically just gets me fired up and I can, I can get under it and I can go. Not everybody likes to do that. You're gonna have to figure out kind of how you feel between each warm up. Uh, but in general, just try to cheat the system. Try to use as little warming up as you can uh, without getting too far away from actually feeling good and feeling strong and feeling ready for the lift. Does that help answer the question? Typically, uh, you know, normal training protocol for a contest is 10 to 12 weeks out, you start out with higher reps and uh, somewhere in the middle from the last, or I'm sorry, when you get to the middle of the uh, training cycle, when you get to be uh, seven weeks out and six weeks out and five weeks out, that's usually where there's quite a bit of volume. There's, there's still a lot of work being done in there. And then as you get down towards the end, you get down towards like the last month, there's less volume, which is just the overall amount of work that you're doing, and the intensity increases, the uh, amount of weight that is lifted for the day, and usually the reps and the sets both get driven downward. Uh, and a standard, you know, there's so many different training methods, so I don't want to generalize it too much, but that's normally what it looks like. Usually uh, for the last week or two, lifters will switch over to singles. Some lifters are, some lifters are so comfortable and like doing singles so much that they'll to utilize them even earlier than that. Um, you have to kind of learn your body and learn how you feel going in. But I think for newer lifters, you could easily go from doing sets of two and sets of three and run right into the meat and not even really worry about true maxes or true singles because it, it just doesn't really matter that much quite yet. Um, and like I said earlier, you want to make sure that when you go into your first meet that you hit a lot of lifts. That is the most important thing, is that you hit a lot of lifts. You're making mo almost all your attempts. So, <clears throat> does that help? All right. You know, nowadays I see a lot of routines that are calling for five sets of five and four sets of four and four sets of six and six sets of four and so on. And a lot of times when you're doing those types of training protocols, the uh, amount of weight that is lifted is a submaximal weight, with submaximal weights ranging from. 78 to 88%, somewhere in that range, 85%, something like that, depending on the program. With those types of programs, a lot of times you're doing multiple sets, multiple reps. Uh, the whole entire training is way different than what you may have seen years ago, especially from people doing things like West Side Barbell programming, where the intensity, the amount of weight you lift, not the music that you play, the weight that you lift is high and the amount of overall work that you do is low or minimal. In this case, the weights are sub-maximal. They're not as heavy as you can do. And so you're spreading out the fatigue over several sets and several reps. And because of that, you're gonna bring less intensity to each and every set. So when you bring less intensity to each and every set and when you use less weight, Again, intensity, I'm not talking about your mindset, although your mindset is part of it, because you don't have to go so fucking crazy to be able to complete these sets and reps because they're not, they're not uh, out of your wheelhouse, they're not out of your lane for you to be able to do, and they're not hard for you to sustain even for all five sets. Um, the likelihood that you'll get injured is a lot lower. So, you know, trying to find protocols that allow you to kind of sit in that pocket where you can get stronger and you can get better um, without using too much weight too quickly is exactly what you're looking for. Uh, in SEMA, I don't know if he's still in here, there he is. Come on up here, in SEMA. Uh, if you don't look like him, <laughs> then uh, don't bother calling us or emailing us. You can't come in the gym. Now, in SEMA here, uh, coming into super training, he deadlifted 633 pounds and uh, more, or 635 I believe it was and then more recently he did a 715 pound deadlift a lot of it was just us tweaking his form a little bit but in addition to tweaking the form we also had him using weights 
that he could manage very easily with the new form that he was using. So he's taking the new form that he's using and he was really dialing it in. Uh, and within, was it two or three months, right? Yeah, about, within about two months, he was able to pack on that much amount of weight on his deadlift in that very, very short, very, very short period of time. Thank <laughs> you.